welcome to the Misophonia Podcast. This is Season 7, Episode 3. My name is Adil Ahmad, and I have Misophonia. This week I'm talking to Freya and Mabel, two grad students at the University of Bristol, who did their final project on human-centered design practices to help cope with misophonia. I actually have a link in the show notes to the book they are making freely available, which is a toolkit for incorporating misophonia awareness into any design process. We also talk a bit about Freya's experience having misophonia and Mabel's interest in misophonia as someone who does not actually have it. This is a super interesting approach to studying misophonia because it comes from an angle of how can the world innovate to better accommodate people rather than the usual research focus, which seems to be around understanding the person, changing the person with misophonia. After the show, let me know what you think. You can reach out by email at hello at misophoniapodcast.com or just hit me up on Instagram or Facebook at misophoniapodcast. And please do uh, try to leave a quick review or rating wherever you listen to this show. It helps drive us up in the algorithms, which in turn reaches more misophones. This episode is... um, sponsored by a personal journaling journaling app that I developed called Basil, B-A-S-A-L. Basil is um, an app that provides AI-powered insights into your journal entries and guides you with new writing prompts based on those insights. You can even explore many different therapy approaches and philosophies. It's available on iOS and Android. Check the show notes or go to hellobasil.com. Also, thanks for the incredible ongoing support of our Patreon supporters. If you feel like contributing, you can read all about the various levels at patreon.com slash misophonia podcast. All right, now here's my conversation with Freya and Mabel. Mabel and Freya, welcome to the podcast. Great to great to finally have you Thank both you. here. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. So, um, well, I guess I think I was in contact with Freya first, maybe just to kind of introduce in, by way of introduction, Freya, do you want to just tell, tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, for sure. Um, So my name's Freya. i am just finished my four-year master's degree at University of Bristol, and that was in management with innovation. And yeah, it was through the innovation part of my degree that we did this project, and also through the innovation part of the degree that I met Mabel. So, yeah. Yeah, and so I um, I study the innovation course as well, um, but I also specialise in anthropology, um so we're both social sciences social scientists sorry um but just kind of with different skills and and those kinds of things so, yeah yeah i love that i took uh, i had an engineering degree but i took anth- anthropology was one of my uh, one of the few electives we were allowed to take um i took anthropology so uh, i'm very yeah, fascinated pretty... by that topic yeah uh, and freya i believe you have misophonia mabel does not or did i get that reversed yes, that's, or? Okay. that's correct Okay, cool. Well, I guess, yeah, let's maybe just jump right into the... Eventually, maybe we'll get into some of your, that, that background and whatnot, but um, I'm sure we, you know, folks would love to hear about the project. I talked to Frey a little bit before, I think, to help maybe with the project, but um, or help think about it. But, yeah, do you want to talk about uh, that? And I think the results came out as well, or, or at least the, the, the analysis. Um, however, you both want to begin that, maybe. Yeah, um, it's... It was a long project, so there's a lot mm-hmm. to talk about. But I guess uh, maybe it's good to start with where we started with the project. Yeah. Um, so as you rightly said, I do suffer with misophonia myself. And Mabel and I, our degree course enables us to explore uh, kind of issues in the world and problems that we'd like to solve. And so this year, I decided that I would like to focus on solving problems around misophonia. And that's kind of where the project was born, um, with this idea of looking at misophonia through a slightly different lens to what's out there at the moment, um, using human-centered and more design thinking related methods. Um, and yeah, so Mabel was really keen to join the project. Um, yeah, I was, um, I guess, I'd never heard of it before, to be honest, um, starting the project. I'd never heard what misophonia was or understood anything about it but I am hearing it from Freya I was really interested in how it seemed to be a um, very individual um, kind of response to to the condition but it was socially 
generated sorry so that was quite a interesting um, conversation between both of those things together um, and starting from a place of knowing nothing was just quite exciting especially as the research was so minimal um, there was just an opportunity to go in quite a few different directions with that right and um, right so I mean Miss Funny Research has really taken off in the last few years I'm sure you know you're talking to Chris and um, he's, he knows a lot about that and it's just been pretty exciting uh, but yeah I mean so the research has been started it's you know there are a few different avenues and uh, it seems like you guys wanted to go with a more unique approach uh, do you want to talk about that approach and kind of what, what the idea was behind the project yeah for sure um, so with innovation it's a human-centered design approach and so there seemed to be this dichotomy in research about how individuals were adapting to the world versus how the world might be able to adapt to individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was definitely biased um, in that first direction. Um, so treatments and therapies and things like that. Instead of looking at how we could actually adapt to the types of worlds that we were living in and the situations to just suit other people with more sensitive needs. And so that's where our user-centered approach um, came in and looking at actually the silent sufferer and understanding them with um, with compassion and with a, I guess, a, a world's thinking, a systems thinking approach that took um, more than just a scientific kind of um, lens um, into consideration. Yeah, that's really interesting that you said uh, that the, the, the dichotomy between um, the person adjusting to the world versus, versus what can what can we what little things simple things can we do in the world to maybe help accommodate mm-hmm. the sufferer? Um, I think that's, that's a, I think common thing with a lot of these you know, a lot of disorders is like the first thing is to kind of almost blame the um, the person who's suffering or put it all on them. Uh, and eventually, with awareness and research, that shifts a little bit. And it's funny we're still in the very early stages. Yeah, I think a lot of the conversations we've had with various people have really been talking about uh, not seeing it as a fault in a person, seeing it as a kind of strength and just something that makes us a bit different. And I think it's that idea that we really wanted to do something that would make people feel empowered rather than just sort of saying, oh, you can go away and take this medication or do this treatment, like something that actually makes them feel seen and a sort of just kind of open society to them in a way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm reading it. This might be a tangent, but I'm reading a book called uh, "Architecture of the Eyes" or something. It's about how recently, um, it's only recently that society is be- the, the sense that that is most um, emphasized in current society is, are the eyes, and they're associated with more thinking. And so, but in the past, it was uh, with especially with oral traditions, it was hearing that was more kind of honored and um and so there's a kind of an ocular focus on on in current society which is kind of like shoving all these other senses down in in term in, in priority so um i don't know yeah, I mean, slightly an- anthropological perspective but i find that kind of kind of fascinating and, and kind of wonder if that's um one way our, our our hearing is just not maybe as in touch with the world and is able to process it no i think that's a really interesting point i think um There's this, so one of my lecturers um, who studies uh, linguistical anthropology, her work is basically based in, uh, oh gosh, no, it's Tibet. So her work's based in Tibet and she works with um, uh, people who talk through sign language um, and how it's an act of um, kind of political dissonance. So her work is really interesting in terms of when you, on you know you don't have access to part of your senses what then becomes important Mm -hmm. and how politicized that can be um as a silent act um it's fascinating work um against um yeah um uh, propaganda and um control and yeah really interesting work as well so yeah definitely um the senses are a key part of anthropology anthropological work and of course in their everyday life. Yeah, I, I just hadn't heard about like senses being emphasized differently or in his throughout history. It's just uh, 
yeah, that's a very interesting concept. Um, yeah, but I, coming coming back to the project, uh, what um, what was the experience? Well, I guess there was a day. Uh, I think I think last time we talked, it was, we were a couple of days away from um, you know the big day that you were going to um, <laughs> run your experience and whatnot. Um, so I was very curious to hear how things turned out. It sounds like they turned out well, um, but yeah, I'd love to hear how that how that went. What kind of what happened? Yeah, so uh, there was a lot of different research we did, but the particular thing that we were building up to when we last spoke was our participatory design workshop. And that was essentially, we just got a group of, was it eight people in a room with misophonia? And we set them the challenge of coming up with ideas and solutions that could help uh, with the day-to-day lives of people with misophonia and we did this through like a range of activities that we spent quite a while preparing so for example one of them was like come up with the worst possible idea and then we sort of flip it on its head Mm. and work back from that and we also sort of gave them uh products commonly associated with triggers and said you've got a minute redesign this product and how could you make it better so just a lot of these activities to really get people thinking and a lot of the things an individual might not have suffered with themselves. So it was that idea of also opening them up to the world of misophonia. And because most of the people hadn't met anyone who suffered with misophonia before, it was a really like eye-opening experience to expand not just our kind of perspectives, but help other people to expand their perspectives as well. And I think the empathy flow- like flowing in that room was incredible people were so supportive yeah I think that empathy became really important when they were doing collaborative work and actually seeing the value in creating ideas for each other um, and seeing that as a wider network of how um, change could start to be kind of investigated and future ways to get involved with things like this I think Freya underplays it when we say we got a group of people together it was like (laughs) <laughs> it was a big um it was a big deal at the time i think it was a real like rush of emotion when we actually got um got to do it and um could see our work in action um but yeah so we went through you know recruiting people coming up with our activities and testing them out um but it was a really um it was a really pivotal activity that we did for our project yeah, that, that sounds like, it reminds me of the convention, the misophonia conventions, whenever you get a bunch of people with misophonia in real life. Maybe we may have talked about this before, but like there is that empathy that, that somehow just kind of uh, reduces it, for me at least, kind of reduces me thinking about triggers because we just, I just know I'm around other people who, even if they trigger me, now there are some people who will trigger me <laughs> to the point where I can't, I can't get over it, but, but generally the, um, uh, the reaction is lower because I know that I could just say something and that person would understand. Um, and we are obviously thinking about each other. So yeah, that is kind of powerful, but we never got to the point like uh, in, in, in your project where we're actually actively working on possible mitigation and redesigning products together. We're usually just listening to a lecture or we're just having beers or something. So um I would love to hear about like yeah. what are some of these were there you know a, a kind of in, interest, particularly interesting designs or coping new coping methods because I mean even right now when people ask me coping methods I say headphones leave a, leave a room it, nothing particularly creative I'm, I'm curious kind of what you guys um, uh, learned and what was created yeah there was a lot of different solutions that were come up with I mean we tried to kind of give people a bit of guidance. Uh, obviously, if we just went in and said, oh, you know, come up with an idea, it would, would have been a bit of a nightmare. So mm-hmm. a lot of our solutions were based around particular environments, as that was something we'd been quite focused on. Um, so, for example, we did sort of ideation activities around cinemas or around public transport. And I remember there was one to do with like private cinema rooms that was quite fun like the idea that you could have a little party room just you and a couple of friends where you don't have to deal with other people's noise just yeah you kind of a controlled environment yeah kind of like a like a living room but kind of like a karaoke room basically yeah basically yeah 
the idea of like someone serving you was one of the um, things that kept coming up. It was like you'd have a, these were more of the silly ideas, um, less like coping, but more in an ideal world, what would be great. And it would be someone or something or some object that could like speak for you and filter out certain noises. So we were, so say you'd look at headphones and you'd, how could you make them even better for someone with, with misophonia? And they were saying, well, you could train it or you could, um, you know, type in or tell it exactly the exact sounds that would trigger you and it would tell you if they were coming up or it would automatically filter them. They were quite um, interesting, fun ideas that seem really futuristic. And then you look at how you can kind of train AI to watch for certain things and you think it's not too far off yeah um, no i mean that's, you know in the near future it's come up in interviews though i've talked I've talk, that that idea and there are people actually actively i think working on something like that where in, yeah. in real kind of like because that's what noise cancelling does it's listening and then also um inverting the signal and then uh, inverting the signal of the you know the background noises so that then you don't hear it, it cancels out so there's the idea of possibly doing that in real time with the uh learning the signature of trigger sounds and inverting them to cancel out as they're going through your ear. Um, so, yeah, we yeah, had a, a few ideas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we had a few ideas as well around um, like food packaging and stuff like that. Mm, uh, yeah, so, it's a common issue, right? Yeah, we have in the UK, I'm not sure if you have it in the US, but we have uh, crisp called Pringles and yes, they basically come in a long... <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I mean... I mean... <laughs> I mean, yes, we've we've all suffered um, hearing other people accentuate their Pringles. <laughs> yes, but the great thing about Pringles is they come in a lovely cardboard tube. Right. So the packaging doesn't rustle so much. So a lot of the ideas were around kind of almost preventative packaging because often the eating noises can be a big trigger, but sometimes it's actually the rustle that really gets you before the eating noise almost. Um, so we had a few ideas around how you might modify food packaging to prevent mm -hmm. that, which is really interesting. Yeah. Or even from, sorry, just even from like a trademarking point of view, how, you know, good good food stamps you, you get, I'm sure, in America as well. Right. I know in the UK we also have specific packaging that is... Um, it's meant to be her, like Her Majesty or be His Majesty now approved. So you have certain brands and they get a royal stamp. Um, and imagine if you could do that with like a misophonia, you get a misophonia yeah, stamp. Yeah, like organic or halal or something like that. Uh, exactly, exactly. So, so there is a, like her, ma her, His Majesty actually approves. Like there is a stamp. Yeah. That's the, and they get and the royal family gets money for for having their. Um, I don't think the royal family gets money. I mean, it's possible. I don't, I'm not <laughs> too wised up on that precisely. But it, it extends from like shoe polish oh to crisps. Okay. Yeah. And it's like, a, it's like a mark of approval. Um, but it's, that's, that's not a new concept, but it's just how could you, you yes, know, replace right. that with, with something, with right. somebody else. Something actually useful. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, um, exactly. And, uh, well, I guess. Um, so, I guess, what was the reaction of the um, of the people who, per who were participating? Was it just like, um, was it hard to get them to participate, or was it just like a, a fountain of energy? And yeah, and, it it varied. Yeah. Um, I think people at some first people are were kind quite... of introverted, right? You know, who have this point was curious Definitely. how to get a bunch of them together. Definitely. I mean. I mean, one instance, a bit of a tangent, but I think it's quite um, a Nothing could be more of a tangent anecdote. than His Majesty's uh, Pringles. Yeah. Thing, so. <laughs> um, a little, well, not the same as that, but um, <laughs> when it became, when it came to kind of a little break time and people got um, a little bit hungry, they, we were in quite a big room um, and people went off literally to every corner of this this whole room um and ate in a corner and it was it probably it's like subtle things like that and then one of our other lecturers came in uh because there was an event around the corner presenting us with a whole tray of sandwiches and we all had like a little silent chuckle to ourselves so yeah. the energy was not you know it wasn't really loud and like uh, excitable but we were all kind of 
quietly quite confident and it felt quite safe um right. and it felt um it felt like no one had experience doing these creative kind of wacky experiments before so you know some people weren't that confident with drawing but you were on a table opposite someone else and you kind of you didn't even have time to think about it um, and that can be really helpful sometimes you just present it with something and you just have to go for it um definitely some activities were more popular than others um i think i think i would say the like almost calling out ideas um so things like the best best and worst ideas were got the best reception um and they facilitated the most conversations which i guess was a bit surprising compared to you know paired paired things where you might be journey mapping an event together um i guess people were encouraged to um have to share a bit more about their personal lives whereas with you know whole group exercises maybe there was a bit more security and numbers and shared triggers that people could pipe up and say oh yeah me too i felt like that or oh i actually just use this type of headphone or i go into this type of space and so i think those work best i don't know if you'd agree for it. one of the things that we we found with the workshop was there was a kind of an element that certainly I was kind of anticipating other people in the room's triggers. So obviously as an organiser of the event, you want everyone to feel safe and have like a really good time and stuff. But there was this element of really not quite knowing what individuals' triggers were. We didn't sort of make them sort of declare them or anything. We did ask if there was any accommodations they would like to be made. Um, but we didn't necessarily have many uh, requests in that regard. But definitely... I certainly was kind of trying to read the room a lot, kind of anticipating things. And when we collected some feedback at the end, I think other people also struggled a bit with not knowing what other people's triggers were mm. because they obviously would try their best to just avoid any sort of triggering noises. But obviously there's going to be, it's really hard to do that constantly. And I think they sort of felt, a little bit overwhelmed by the fact that they might not be able to um, prevent someone else feeling triggered. Yeah, that's interesting. That is kind of similar, I guess, similar to a convention. I mean, once we start talking to people, we feel comfortable, but there is that initial people kind of tiptoeing around the room, <laughs> um, not wanting to trigger trigger anybody. But that, at some point, for most, uh, for many people, that kind of subsides a little bit once once uh, we've kind of seen that we're all we're all friends and we kind of get each other yeah um, definitely so i guess um so, so the, it sounds like the workshop was one uh, one part of the project was there you want to talk about other parts of the project um yeah um we so we also ran a meta-analysis previous to um doing the um, participatory workshop um basically to prove our hypothesis that there were um social solutions lacking from academia um and so we looked at 166 um, literature papers, um, all containing the words misophonia in the title um, from 2012 um, up until 2022, Christmas time, mm -hmm. so the end of the year, um, and found that only six papers um, actually provided a social or um, environmental solution um, that prioritised adapting a world for a person as opposed to... Um, the individual adapt adapting for um, their their own environment, um, and basically, so from there, that's I guess where we kickstarted this idea that we could have an influence by doing a participatory workshop. But that was quite a key um, a key moment for us, and to confirm that in a way that made sense to academia, um, as opposed to just using our own criteria. We actually went straight to the source and tried to. Um, make sure that it, it was very clear yeah. <laughs> you know in the in the methods that we were using that that was a rigorous way of, of saying that this is this is what's missing and here's how we could fill that gap right uh yeah we had uh olivia ninabar on on the podcast who, who did who done a master's i guess on uh misophonia kind of in the workplace and kind of what could be done to kind of help accommodate um misophonia in the workplace um 
Is, did you so uh, you know a lot of people come on who are students, so they're asked about student accommodations. Of people I've seen the workplace talk about open office environments. Did you focus on any one type of environment, or was it kind of like looking for I don't know, possible solutions to any and all of them? Yeah, I think we had elements of focus on different environments throughout the project. Uh, very early in the project, we conducted a rapid prototype um, in a theatre. So we produced a sonic map, which essentially would track the performance and potential triggering noises throughout that performance. And we handed it out to audience members and we got some really good feedback from that. And that was something at one point we were like, oh, this is, you know, this is a great solution. But we did end up pursuing that more generalized direction of trying to kind of make sure there's infrastructure underneath all these solutions to ensure that they are sensitive and effective. But later in the project, we did actually come back to the kind of entertainment industry. I think um, we've talked about sort of cinemas and ideas around that just when we spoke about the workshop. And we did notice that a lot of ideas were cropping up in this space. And we did spend some time looking into that in some depth. But I think at the end, we just really thought we wanted to nail down the kind of support infrastructure for idea generation around misophonia. Are you talking about like a, is there like a, a common, common infrastructure to, uh, or common um, ideas to kind of support people who are, who have, who have misophonia that can be applied to all environments? Yes, we we actually took it from more of the perspective from businesses and mm, yeah. um, entrepreneurs and academics, so creating a toolkit um, for them. So um, I know we touched on it a bit earlier about um, the actual you know researchers having misophonia as well, um, but one of our key key pivots um, was when also I hope you don't mind me talking about. Um, yeah, Freya. Um, but basically, it became quite difficult sometimes doing um, so many exercises and so many activities on misophonia because it it becomes a really uh, a present thing in um, in your life, particularly if you suffer with it. And for Freya, it was becoming quite damaging for our kind of work mm-hmm. um, in that it was making it worse in personal life. And so we thought, well, surely if um, if so many researchers who are interested in the topic you know, by chance also suffer with misophonia, it's often how they find out about it, then this can't just be a problem that um, that we're having. And so we, we thought that because, yes, research it has been picking up at such a rapid rate, which is amazing, but surely this is the time to make sure that the research that is increasing is being done in an ethical way that protects the people that you're looking into as well as the mm. people who are investigating the topic itself. Um, and so we were inspired by... Um, Phil Hesketh's um, consent kit and ethics kit Um, and so basically decided as our main output for our uh, final master's degree that we would be creating a online and book version of a toolkit for businesses if they wanted to improve the way that they um, address issues um, for their consumers who have these novel conditions or academics who just want to take a different approach um, and incorporate um, different styles of of researching um, within their own disciplines Um, so that's where our novel condition toolkit um, came from basically yeah i'd love to hear more about that because that's that's very interesting i've uh i i um i thought about um i'm sure i think even folks like chris have thought about uh, like training for hr uh, human resources at companies to kind of help their employees learn about misophonia and potentially get resources but i didn't even think about like a a design toolkit that could be used for um you know helping consumers like thinking about it while you're designing a product or or something um yeah that's very interesting do do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about that toolkit now that's organized and what what it yeah i I think it's it's interesting that you kind of picked up on the kind of more commercial side of it there and I think it's very much a product of the way that we've studied over the last four years that we are quite um, oriented towards thinking about the bigger environment. So we do consider the kind of 
business and commercial environment. Although this is something we don't consider to be a commercial project ourselves, I think it would be a great thing if a business was to be more successful because they were providing a more inclusive offering. Um, and there is just that fundamental commercial element to it that you just can't ignore. Um, so yeah, the toolkit was very much, we wanted it to appeal to a range of people. So it was written very, it's very open to interpretation. It's not a set, you know, step-by-step -step process. It's more of a guide. You can dip in and out of sections, but what it, it's, it's very honest. We've been very open about, oh yeah, we did this. It didn't really work. All of that kind of nitty gritty stuff that we would like other people to avoid doing, that's all in there as well. It's by no means like here is the perfect polished method. It's just something that we hope will evolve and grow. And, you know, everything has a first edition, a first version. And we know that it's not perfect. We know that for a fact. Um, but we just really wanted to put out a starting point, something that, you know, because misophonia is a condition that's picked up so much in research recently, but there's not to say that's not going to happen with other conditions as well. I mean, we've seen it in the past with, I mean, we've already mentioned autism, ADHD, things like that. Yeah, there's going to be other conditions like this out there as well. And those other conditions can benefit from this process too and this sensitive way of researching. That's really interesting, yeah, because the autism community has um, done a lot in getting events at, um, it, like, the, those quiet, I don't know if you have it in, in the UK, but we have, uh, like, sensory-friendly days for the, uh, museums, theaters, grocery stores. Um, yeah, but... we do. We, we have them in Bristol a lot as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we both study in Bristol. Um but that even for careers fairs, um, we have, you know, the early times that you can go in where they're quieter. Yeah. And we had it for our own um, event, I believe, uh, really recently. Um, yeah, but yeah, they're really important and they're really um, well received in the UK as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder if toolkit like this might benefit from being open sourced on like GitHub or something where people can contribute and potentially add to or or fork and, and and create their own versions yeah that that's really always been our intention with it um whilst we haven't necessarily worked out the mechanism to do that yet uh the toolkit leans already on other people's work um mm -hmm. as mabel mentioned earlier phil hesketh and his ethics kit was a big con contribution mm -hmm. but you know none of this is necessarily really original to us it's just that we bought different fields together and made those connections so yeah it's a hundred percent something that we would open source and would encourage people to use and tell us oh no we didn't like this we loved this like we would yeah. just love for it to grow and become a really comprehensive and a collaborative thing i guess is it is, i think uh um, it's kind of bad. I think maybe Chris sent me, or or I, is it public yet? Like, is it is it published? Like uh, some like a link? Uh, we'll have if it is, we'll have a link in the show notes for sure. But, yeah, um, that'd be good. We had it as a book because mm -hmm. we wanted to people to use it as kind of a, a manual and a workbook and a right. question book. It's it's split into questions and themes uh, yeah. um, as opposed to. Uh, like a linear story, as Freya said, um, and we weren't, you know, really in the view of of selling it in a in a really commercial way, um, and also as a website, we just thought it would make it more accessible. So we do have mock ups available, which we can definitely yeah. link to. But yeah, we'd love to publish it um, even better in an open source way. That that's pretty much the aim of of why we did it, so it can be used by whoever yeah. um, whoever thinks it will benefit them. Yeah. yeah, we can talk about yeah, we can talk about that later. Um, I guess what are so do you want to summarize like what are some of the um, I guess most promising um, suggestions from the toolkit that that you'd love to see more companies like like the top maybe the top few things that you'd love to see companies consider when they're um, yeah when they're designing for misophonia. <laughs> I think the main thing is I think 
it would be um, presumptuous to say that many companies are even thinking about misophonia right now. But I guess the general learning of not just the toolkit, but our entire project is this idea of treating people who suffer with a condition as like a creative force for good, not just someone they've got to make sure they tick the box for. You know, these those of us who suffer with this condition, like we have this pent up passion and interest, like this is why things like this podcast exist, right? We all have this creative energy that we're willing to expel. So I think the main learning really from the toolkit is you got to go and talk to those people. You've got to get them involved. You can't mm-hmm. just sit from your chair wherever and say, oh, yeah, this is going to be the best thing. You've really got to go and talk to them and understand, not just make a decision based on an article you read, you read online. I think that would be the biggest learning. Yeah, this yeah, is the thing. In, oh, sorry, go on. Investing in people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, just saying investing in people. Right. Um, in in more ways than money really yeah the the, the episode that uh, i'm editing right now actually yeah one of the um points at the end was how um uh, claire who i was talking to said like Misoph- despite everything she's gone through this misophonia is, is uh um she she feels like she has the superpower of empathy you know that 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 misophonia is kind of given her and and uh and and you said even Freya like you were you were like reading the room which I think uh, I said that on the podcast a lot I feel like a lot of us who are HSP which is highly sensitive person and have misophonia are feel like we're more quickly and more intensely able to kind of read a room or or notice people who are not or kind of talking past each other or something like that um yeah definitely agree with that (laughs) <laughs> so I, yeah, I agree. I mean, that the, you know, even in a commercial, maybe even more, more importantly, in a commercial environment, that's that's a very valuable uh, skill that's hard to quantify, but um, you know, can definitely make or break a, a product or or something that a commercial company is working on. Um, so I, I'm curious, Mabel, did uh, before Fred, did you you said I think you said you hadn't heard of this so funny at all? Like was. No, no, nothing. I I didn't know what it was. I didn't know anything about it. I'd never even heard of the word. Looking looking back, do you do you notice? Do you do you remember anyone, maybe your family or your or your life growing up that you're like, oh yeah, that was misophonia. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, But even more so, it's it's that when I'm out and about, Mm -hmm. or when I'm here overhearing other people's conversations, it's like really relevant and i'll just message freya and i'll say you know i just heard this or i just heard that and um it's completely changed um how i um understand how people think and how they um, are actually processing the things around me it's actually i feel really improved my kind of empathy for other people's um day-to-day lives by just doing this project yeah and sorry go on freya I was just going to say, I think Mabel and I have had quite a lot of interesting conversations because, you know, we we all sense and perceive the world in different ways. And obviously doing this project, me and Mabel spent a lot of time together and, you know, we might be sat in a lecture and someone opens a packet of crisps and, you know, that's it. I'm like out for the count. Yeah, like, <laughs> don't the try and talk to me. <laughs> don't do anything. Yeah, yeah. And And to be fair, Mabel might not even notice that someone's opened the packet of crisps, but she will have definitely noticed something that, like some sort of, I don't know, like a social cue or something that I've completely missed. So I think it was just very interesting, the collaboration between someone who does suffer with it and someone who doesn't, just having that, the two perspectives meant that we stayed very like, we didn't go down any rabbit holes, really. We were very, like, focused. And... No. Yeah. I would say, I mean, hypersensitive um, or did you, so you, did you say highly sensitive? Yeah. Yeah, highly sensitive people. I watched a TED Talk on it, like, really at the beginning of the, um, uh, at the project. And I, you know, showed it to Freya and I, we talked about it. 
I also feel like I am a highly sensitive mm-hmm. person, just not an auditory mm-hmm. highly sensitive mm-hmm. person. Um, so yeah, the types of things that Ray was talking about, you know, social cues or whatever, um, it was actually quite nice because we kind of filled each other's, like, <laughs> what we lacked in each other, but we still had the empathy um, there and that kind of became, um, you know, really valuable and, and it just... Yeah, it just came became more pronounced, I guess, in our work. Um, yeah, that's funny. I'm I'm kind of now. I don't know if you know the movie "See No Evil, Hear No Evil" with Gene Wilder and Richard. Yeah, Pryor. yeah. I'm yeah. thinking like an opposite version where two two people are hypersensitive on each of those senses. Um, yeah, literally. <laughs> um, oh, interesting. Um, Freya, do you want to talk a little bit about? Um, you know, we don't have to go the whole hour like I usually do, but I'm just cur- kind of curious about your your background with misophonia kind of when it started and kind of how it led up to here yeah for sure um I guess like many people I can't really pinpoint when it began necessarily I think it was probably sometime around the age of 10 or 11 uh, but I can't really say with any certainty but I I think I really started to notice and realize that it was something that was particularly affecting my life um, around four or five years ago when I was doing my A-levels. Um, mm. I just really, really struggled in exam situations. Um, just if someone, sorry, trigger warning, if someone was breathing really loudly or like tapping a pen, jiggling their knee, I was just completely out. Like I just could yeah. not focus. And I that my academics were so important to me and it just seemed so insane that something so small could wreck this exam that I prepared for for months. And so I went through the process of trying to kind of get an accommodation and I did manage to get a separate room um, for exams, but not through recognition of misophonia. It was, I got diagnosed with hyperacusis at the time, which I don't believe I do have I think it is definitely misophonia but it was a means to an end and yeah it's it's kind of always been sitting there at a low level and something it's very personal so it was a very big step to bring the word out into the real world and propose it as a project and I was quite nervous to do it and I just feel so lucky about how well received it's been that people have wanted to start conversations with me about oh is there anything I do that I could do better to prevent you from being triggered or things like that even on our course like our lecturers are just so much more aware of things like this and I think yeah it's just been incredibly kind of I feel incredibly privileged to have been able to explore it within this safe and supportive environment that not everybody has um yeah to be honest yeah and what about your family what do they what do they think because they must Um, sounds like they were probably triggers early on obviously yeah (laughs) Uh, i think my mum suffers to a degree um maybe not to the same extent but there's definitely there's definitely signs of it there um But I think it's been a really lovely thing that I think most people who have misophonia do struggle with their immediate family just because you're you're with them all the time. You know, it's it's not that personal. It's just how it is. Um, But it's been a really nice thing to to go from this thing that you have that honestly, sometimes it might just seem like I'm in a bad mood or whatever, but for them to kind of understand through seeing me do this project how much it means to me and how there's a whole community out there as well and I think it's just been extremely valuable and I you know I feel so much more comfortable at home I wear my loop airplugs at meal times and things like mm-hmm. that and I just mm-hmm. feel you know it's not such a not that it was a taboo but you know it's just something I can talk about now and not not feel judged at all and uh well and so maybe going back to the project like uh if the project's over any ideas on on what do you guys 
are you planning to work on anything else related to the project and extension of the project? Any ideas um, that, that have come out from the project, or uh, if not, where would you like to see it kind of like go go next? Uh, you know, after we open source it and, <laughs> and all that. Um, we're hoping to publish a white paper mm. um, that we've been working on from our meta analysis. So hopefully, fingers crossed, we can get that out um, again as like a free open source text um, about what we found. And so there, you know, that kind of gives reason for our toolkit to exist. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's this summer. Um, we were just talking about it on a science session um with so quiet yeah, yeah. so with chris edwards um and um he asked us the same thing and we're, we're both keen you know to continue it we i guess because we've been in this university environment it's kind of difficult to see how we could facilitate that um outside of that um but that doesn't mean that we wouldn't want to do it i think i personally you know just speaking for myself I've loved it so much. I would love to take it on. Um, I think it would just be a, a problem of figuring figuring out how and where um, I could place, you know, myself and my skills and what the things I've developed um, in the future. Um, but you know, we've done it once. We can do it again. I'm yeah, sure. I mean, because <laughs> there's you know, there's consultants and there's train there's like training things that people go into companies and then do training sessions or. Uh, I'm just, I'm, I'd be curious if, uh, usually it's people who have been in the industry for a while, um, you know, but uh, that, you know, that's a potential avenue um, is to you know, do private co contract training or whatever. Yeah, it's, um, it's definitely something we have discussed as kind of, I guess, a more commercial route for the work we've done. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think... It could still be open source, but you could just be, yeah, being the author of, of it would have a little bit more cachet than some random nerd yeah GitHub. <laughs> and i think we have got to this position where we do feel like we are experts at the human-centered side of bisophonia mm -hmm. and as far as our research has shown us there isn't anyone else who's doing what we're doing um and that's quite a special place to be in especially with a condition that's becoming so much more just growing and people are talking about it a lot more um so i think in that way we we see ourselves as really lucky to be at the forefront but like mabel said it's just difficult to see how to progress it now that we've finished university but i think we would both absolutely love to i guess yeah, now that you finished university do you have any immediate plans as to kind of what you what you want to do next is it more more uh more school or do you have a a big job lined up at Microsoft or? <laughs> um, personally, nothing planned as of mm -hmm. yet. Uh, not to say that I'm not looking, right, right, um, right. but just nothing's quite aligned as of yet. I'm uh, hoping to stay in Bristol, um, I think for the moment, um, but I'm I'm going away to do some conservation work. Um, so I'm <laughs> kind of having a break from uh, academia completely. Um, so I'll be in Central America doing that. Um, but then coming back, yeah, looking maybe into third sector work, maybe into policy design, what's, what's um, third policy sector? labs. I don't think we've heard. So, what like charities. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, non profit kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, non profits. Um, but yeah, kind of leaving it open on purpose, really. Yeah, no, that's, um, that's fair. <laughs> but not necessarily <laughs> Mesothonia full time, but because um, it's not it's not a huge job market for Mesothonia. But, but it, I, we don't know what it will look like. Right, so right. I mean, it's it's not something that I would ever say no to. Um, this has been, you know, I think you know, one of the most rewarding things I've done at university. So if I was, you know, to be able to work in it, you know, as a job or a career, then I'm, I'm super, super open to that. So I guess um, we'll leave that space open. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I guess we're, yeah, we're coming up to a, a, about an hour here. Um, a, anything else you want to share with other, you know, folks who have misophonia or, you know, uh, young, young young students coming up who are looking for projects to do any any uh anything you'd like to see taken to the next level explored more in 
in human centered um, um, you know work with Mrs. Brennan because you're right I think there's a lot of neuro centered and psycho centered work where it's kind of analyzing what's going on in here but the related yeah. what I'm personally more interested in like uh, why I do the podcast is all the the repercussions of misophonia on on life on the other people around us and their effects on us um, yeah just curious I'd love to yeah. I'd love to get involved with some um, arts projects surrounding misophonia um, maybe see where um, the realm of of theatre, of music, of fine arts, of architecture, um, those kind of uh, disciplines might be able to take misophonia. Um, I'd be really interested in in seeing where that could go, and you know, potentially getting involved with people who are also interested in investigating something that maybe they themselves have nothing about, and see and see what they can give to the um, to the growing body of research. I think would be my interest. So yeah. Do you have like a music uh, theater theater background? I'm just asking because there are some there are some of there's some rumblings happening in, in, in some creative projects in, in that regard. So um, I'm curious if you have I, some background. I don't necessarily yeah. have a background in theater. I have a background in creative arts, so mm -hmm. um, visual communication. Um, but I love I love theater. I love music. I love arts. I love the creative industries. Um, and yeah, so I always have an interest in those and um, participate in lots of events to do with those things. So it's definitely um, aligned with kind of the things I love and my values. Right. Yeah. Well, one thing I will I'll talk, I want to yeah, go to Freya again about yeah next next steps kind of things too. But I, I forgot one thing I wanted to ask you, uh, Mabel, was just about um, um, misophonia. Thinking you know being an anthropologist or anthropology uh, someone who studied anthropology, have you? I don't know if like heard of misophonia in history, but have you, has it made you think about other societies in the past and, and maybe how they've dealt with sound and hearing and possibly, um, mi I don't know, misophonia related issues in, in, in other societies, whether they were ex yeah, somewhere extra sensitive to sound or something, or maybe valued it more. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I guess from kind of a small scale societies, if you kind of have a look at the bare necessities and I guess people who are more, um, who live alongside lands rather than um, in super urban populations, mm -hmm. if you're going to centre your your investigations um on on subgroups like that um then yeah i'm sure it does become really relevant because um there is this tendency to be more connected with your environment and with um natural noises and obviously we know that um misophonia is triggered by kind of very close human human reaction and so if you look in um in places like japan we um myself and freya kind of just um, discovered this text that was talking about um, how there's such a dichotomy of silence and immense noise. Um, I know that Freya's um, visited herself and she was talking about how, um, you know, there's complete respect of silence everywhere. And then you go into these environments, whether it's an arcade, whether it's mm -hmm. a karaoke bar, that have these, it's just overwhelming with noise. Yeah. Um, and so for such a different society, like Japanese society, and you know, there's plenty of anthropological texts on Japan, having this um, dichotomous kind of nature of, of how the individuals um, uh, exist. So there's a very like, seminal text by Ruth Benedict um, written, um, you know, for the American um, government at the time about Japan. Um, it would be interesting to see how that dichotomy could be um, understood literally through one exact lens, you know, for example, auditory um, conditions and things like that. So, yeah, no, it's, it's um, super possible that that is... Um, either really relevant as a biological feature or as a very urban contemporary kind of um, issue that has been developed over time. Um, and I I mean, I've, I haven't come across anything that, that right. studies that specifically. So then I'm sure there's quite a big gap for that. Right, I feel like that should, should maybe be studied. Like, like I think you said about um, uh, something about biological, but maybe we've 
um, we've become so disconnected so quickly from from you know uh, the lifestyle we had thousands of years ago that potentially we're we're our brains are mis can are mis uh, interpreting sounds as dangers um, when they shouldn't be when when hearing hearing something as a danger a long time ago like whether it's a uh, uh, an animal coming after you or something rustling when as a warning to something could be getting uh, misinterpreted now as you know somebody mm. chewing <laughs> or or somebody and, tapping their yeah pants. i mean there's a i mean a lot of studies do focus on that of of igniting a fear kind of biological reaction um so that's definitely been done but i think probably underexplored is the social elements of that and looking at that from a whole right. system is probably lacking as opposed to the neurodiverse this is a fear reaction from certain triggering right. noises right. um yeah that gap can definitely be filled yeah um yeah, so freya you were you were in japan and could you talk more about this dichotomy i'm very interested because i feel like there could be a, a theater or a musical based in japan <laughs> all about misophonia centered around this um, yeah um yeah so i traveled to japan in 2019 so just before i started uni and yeah it's it's very interesting because as as mabel said japan's obviously a culture that you know they really respect their their sort of zen their really quiet right. areas but then i just <laughs> you just go into one of their arcades and like it is just the loudest place i've ever been in my life i couldn't stay in there for more than about so five loud seconds in terms of triggering not just like like a music concert or something can be loud but it could be enjoyable yeah it's just beyond anything i've ever heard yeah. before because <laughs> not only is it volume loud but you've got all of these different machines at least right. in a concert there's this element of harmony, harmony. Yeah, yeah. and you know, a single source of noise. But in these arcades, it was just all, especially because they're all based around like different characters and stuff, so different pictures of voices, different right. settings of the games. And it was just completely overwhelming. Um, but yeah, I think as Mabel touched on, this kind of cultural context around misophonia is a really, really interesting area. And although my background's in management, culture is still something that we talk about all the time, um, maybe more in terms of sort of organizational culture and brand culture and things like that. But, you know, we all have our own experiences and our kind of things that happen to us in life that lead to the way that we perceive things and how we view things. And I think there could be some really interesting research to be done in terms of that and misophonia because I I only know my experience of growing up in the UK with certain noises and you think how different that must be for someone in Japan or mm -hmm. I'd just been to Vietnam for example and again it's totally different soundscape um, and it's just such an interesting I think it's something that is going to be so interesting to see how it develops whether the prevalence is the same across different cultures or if there is some element of our culture that perhaps um, sort of exacerbates misophonia. Well, I guess, yeah, I mean, uh, once again, I know we went on a, a, on a little tangent at the end, which, which usually happens with uh, m most of my interesting conversations. But um, I, I did want to leave uh, Freya a chance to, to talk about is what would you like to kind of maybe see looked at next or studied next as a kind of a follow on to your study? Yeah, so when we did our meta analysis, we were looking for I mean, predominantly, we're looking for the presence of kind of human centered methodologies and socially based solutions. But we did also uh, look at a number of other factors. So one of those was the country of origin of the paper. Mm. Um, but we also looked at gender of authorship. And I think those two areas, although we didn't find anything particularly conclusive in our study, I think those are going to be really interesting areas to explore further i mean it ties in with our whole conversation about culture i guess but um i think 
yeah, just more studies that look at the social perspective. So thinking about um, misophonia in specific contexts as well. Um, you mentioned about misophonia in the workplace, and that sounds really fascinating and really interesting. I think it's just continuing to fill these um, different environments where it's not necessarily been considered before. And we're at a really lucky time where there's plenty of different environments to consider. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of exciting things to come for sure. Yeah, yeah. There's a, I think it's an untapped landscape for research. I think it's an untapped, I've mentioned this to a, a bunch of musicians and, and writers, it's an untapped creative landscape, untapped emotional landscape to explore um, that most people who think of us as just irritable people don't realize. <laughs> And so, um, yeah, it, it's great. And I'm sure a lot of people, you know, reading your toolkit and white people will learn about it. I think a lot of people who participated in your in your workshop probably learned a lot as well. Um, so thanks for thanks for doing that work. And, and I hope this uh, reaches a very wide, wide audience. Thank you. I hope thanks. so yeah. thanks for having us on. And yeah, no, if anybody's interested in, in talking to us more, um, we're always here to have a conversation about it. Right. So, yeah. yeah, I guess I'll get your info and put it in the, in the show notes for anyone listening. They can, they can go to the... Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Fran Mabel. Exciting to see this kind of work that is not the usual approach to tackling misophonia, uh, but I think it's, it's very approachable to people in the design community and can have a huge impact. If you like this episode, don't forget to leave a quick review. Or just hit the five stars wherever you listen to this podcast. You can hit me up by email at hello at misophoniapodcast.com or go to the website misophoniapodcast.com. It's usually easiest to send a message on Instagram or Facebook at misophoniapodcast and on Twitter, we're Misophonia Show. Support the show by visiting Patreon at patreon.com slash misophoniapodcast. The music, as always, is by Moby. And until next week, Wishing you peace and quiet.